Soviet Union. But, um, they're uh, in Finland, Iceland, Denmark, Sweden, and Norway. Trade union density is an average around 70%. In Iceland, it's 85, 90. But they're different countries. And this is something we don't often want to talk about on the left. The homogenous cultures, right? People in Sweden are Swedes. People in Iceland are icy. <laughs> People in you know, Norway and Norwegian, they're not heterogeneous cultures, they're homogenous cultures. They've been able to develop certain labour standards with certain agreements that have been able to develop with their own employer organisations. Plus the trade unions a long time, even before the depression years, decided that it was very smart for the trade unions to get involved in the payment of social benefits. And so they negotiated with long-term social democratic governments that the unions would be a central part in the payment of things such as um, unemployment benefits. And hence, it's very, very difficult to get rid of the trade union in the Scandinavian country because it's such an integrated and integral part, not just of not just of, uh, of your life, but also of the, the whole society. So it's much different. I think we're much more closer to, say, Great Britain uh, and the United States. Um, but also, I, I, I did speaking to a Britain last year, and and a couple of things really uh, really impressed me about the British trade union movement, despite all the problems that it's faced over the, the last 30, 35 years. One is most of the big unions have annual conferences. I think that's a great thing. Huge conferences, okay, some, some of it's bureaucratic, but every union big conference has fringe events on the side. So although you might not be able to speak at the main conference, your organisation or the party that you're a member of or your, or your socialist grouping or the black support group or whatever would have fringe events at all these conferences. And it was a wonderful expression I think of a democratic culture within their organisations that allow these things to, to happen. And we don't seem to do that a great deal here in Australia. Um, also in Great Britain, in comparing that to Australia, I think in Australia there's a real problem that we've, that's happened is that, is that our Fair Work Commission, you know, the misnamed Fair Work Commission, is that this system of labour courts in Australia has turned everything terribly legalistic about how you pull on a blue, how you get into a work site, how you do everything. It's a legal nightmare. People talk about the legal, the, the legal problems that British unions face. It's not the same. A British unions' big problem is when they might call a strike and then it's challenged in a high court and the ballots are examined and whatever. But fundamentally, a British uh, union it has a lot more freedom in the in the basic workplace than we do in Australia. On the other on the other hand, you have the United States, where one great thing I think in the States is that if you get 50 plus one percent in 27 of the 20 of the 27 of the 50 states, is that it means that you get 100 percent union coverage. Uh, in the other 23 right to work states, you have union density rates down to like in Texas where it's less than 2%, South Carolina is 2.9% and of course you see the collapse in living standard that's accompanying this because in our sort of countries union density does have a reflection on what and that's why I'm so concerned about it, it has a definite reflection on what our standards of living are eventually going to be. You have poor union density levels in a developed uh, industrial, developed post-industrial or industrial economy you're going to see a collapse in living standards. Uh, I have, these are now my, some thoughts that I have on how can we fix these problems up. Okay. Uh, I think trade unions must always be fundamentally oppositionists. Okay? We have to be oppositionists. Um, we must be a, a, the oppositional force in Australian society and we must never allow again for the co-option of our movement into, uh, into the arms of governments or employers or any type of organisations like that. No more prices and incomes forward. No more law. We've really got a great problem. We'll all sit down together and we'll work it out. No, okay. We can work with the government in certain areas, that's good, but let's have always have our, our standards very clear. Because once, once they put their arms around you, once they embrace you, once they place you on the boards, the saddest part is, is that most 
people from the trade union movement, not all, but most, will start trying to hate this, what you call their social betters. They do. I've seen it all my life. It's embarrassing at times, but it's also a tragedy for our movement. I think trade unions must become a lot leaner in the way that they are run. Uh, and that's a reflection of my own organisation in our national office, which has become, I think, a, uh, uh, a very heavily bureaucratised organisation. I've seen it time and again in other, other organisations. But for example, in real terms, we're probably, uh, 15 years ago, we might have had a million extra members in absolute terms in the Australian Trade Union, maybe 750,000. <coughs> but there's probably 25 to 30% more union officials running around the place. One of the reasons is that, is that EBAs have been a nightmare. You know, they're just, any union official here will tell you a delegate, it's an absolute nightmare, right? You go and do an EBA, I just finished doing an, you know, an EBA that took eight months to run. My mate Graham here, who works for Cube, Chris Corrigan's Cube, this bloke here should get the Victoria Cross at the double bar. He's been there 20 years. Uh, he was in the last rounds of uh, talks with Cube and it took two years, you know. Why are we taking two years to run an EBA if you can't do it after, my, my thing is that if you can't do it after six meets, you might as well put in protected action and go and have the blue, you know. But, um, you know, we really need to be lean. We need to be able to delegate our responsibilities to delegates. Um, I think trade unions have to be far less bureaucratic in their dealings with their members, potential members, and with the uh, and with the public. I went to the miners union building yesterday. Some of my greatest and most dearest comrades and coal miners, wonderful people, some wonderful leadership, great people. You go to the building and fair dinkum, you'd have more chance of getting into the Australian Mint than getting into the miners union building. You have to press a button, um, you have to wait before that button opens and the up button opens, you go up the stairs and then you have to press another button. Make it a bit harder to get into a union office. Like union offices have to be open. Okay? They have to be. They have to be welcoming places. What we're doing indirectly is that we're just putting barriers in front of what we're going to be what we're going to become. Or what we're supposed to be about. I think there has to be a, a radical and re redevelopment and re-engagement of members through through the development of a, of a type of the shop stewards movement in this country. That's not particularly run by uh, union uh, union officials or whatever, but it has to be driven that we need some type of shop stewards movement that can come across all different types of industry. One of the things I hope to develop in uh, uh, I hope we can develop that if um, our merge is successful in the CFMEU where uh, we'll have five or six different lots of groupings where we can start developing strong, a strong shop stewards culture across industry so that we can start cross-pollinating ideas and start getting people to really think about each other and each, you know, each other's problem. It's not just your own industry that's, a, that's the problem. I think all unions uh, really have to have monthly meetings open for all members. Um, I'll give you one example. Last night again, I was at another another meeting. I go to lots of meetings. You know, I don't know what I think I need sometimes. All I do is go to meetings. Like a fair dinkum, I might dress up as Santa Claus and go to one. The, this shirt, by the way, when I wore it in the MUA, the second day I wore it in the MUA, they called me Humphrey B. Bear. You know, the girls in the office, thanks a lot. You know, I said, I'm not Humphrey Big Bear. I started using his hand business and everything else, you know. I'll go to the dress it in one day. But um, the, um, <coughs> the construction, uh, the CFMEU General Construction Divisions, you know, wonderful union, you know, great fighting organisation, fantastic. But if you're a BL and you've just amalgamated with the CFMEU General Construction Division, you probably think something's odd, is that BLF, Despite all of its difficulties and it's, uh, you know, it's a bit rough around the edges at times, I guess, is that the BLF used to have a monthly general meeting. And at that monthly general meeting, under the rules of the BLF, the secretary of the union could be removed by the monthly meeting. And in fact, that's how John Cummings, in the end, got rid of Norm Gallagher. He did it at the floor of a meeting of a, 
in Melbourne of the uh, of the uh, of the PLF. So we need to do those sort of things. You know, those sort of basic things that I think really sort of democratises. Uh, this place here used to have uh, monthly meetings, and then they had then went to quarterly meetings. I don't know whether they have meetings. I think only the executive meetings now. So once upon a time, and in fact, when I was a younger man, and Alan Muir here would certainly remember, is that we used to have fortnightly meetings in the trades hall. Remember? Yeah, yeah. Remember that, Bobby? And they were they were fair dinkum. People would get up to have you know really powerful debate, different sides. It was fantastic, you know. And then if we get over, you know, you just get over at the, the RSL club across the road and get fired up and. You know, make some brilliant speeches. I wish I could remember a couple of them. The, uh, I think the other thing we have to do on the legislative front is really fight to see genuine legislation and laws to make organise, organising a less fortress business than it is, and that's on a, on a sort of institutional reform. We have to have, it, like in this country, we have to demand that a Labor government eventually puts in things like anti-scab legislation, like they actually have in. Okay, another thing we need two, just two in my opinion to give us three. One is you should have an unfettered right of entry to any workplace. Okay. Second is that you have to have anti scab legislation. And third is you have a you have a bargaining agent or an anti free labor legislation. Because the part that gives me the greatest shits of all is you organise and organise and organise. You get EBAs up and get improvements and conditions and then duds don't join the union. Better. And the last thing that I've got to uh, uh, speak about, and it goes to that idea about becoming leaner, trade unions in Australia have to really look on the back about what the cost of union dues are. And I'll tell you why. Is that in Britain, the average cost of union dues is around about four quid a week. Okay, about eight bucks. Um, at our national conference in February, I was the only official who spoke against it at the MUA National Conference. Uh, the average um, union dues the Wharf is going to pay from June, uh, from July 2017 will be $52 a week. A week, $208 a month. And um, the average Wharf will also in the terminal, so they pay $5 a week into, uh, into their own um, hardship fund, and they also pay another four dollars a week. So that the, so that the, the, the state branch, as, as Graham does, so that'll put their, uh, their dues up to about sixty-one or sixty-two dollars a week. We're going to find some walk is going to start walking now. Not many, but some will start walking. But it starts to rot. It's got it's got out of hand. Organisations really have to start saying, well, if you just you can't just keep increasing, increasing, increasing. This isn't just an MUA thing, it's other unions around the place. Because unions are supposed to be social movements, okay? We didn't become union leaders to just, you know, you know, to dress in nice Humphrey B. Bear shirts and, you know, be sort of like, it's, you know, my national secretary is one of the smart bloke, but he's also, I think, he thinks he's a stand up comic, so I'd probably get a bit of, you know, get a bit of a gift out of Paddy's uh, corner. But, we really have to examine those issues and really make sure that joining the union has to be a really easy process. It shouldn't be a difficult process. It shouldn't be a torturous process. You shouldn't have to wait out in the rain or something and wait for somebody to buzz you in. You know, it should be simple, it should be easy, it should be friendly, so that people really think that their union is an absolute part of their life and not just something that's they have to pay because all their workmates pay it, so I'll pay it. Um, because what it's doing, it doesn't create the sort of uh, union movement we want, which is um, one where we're locked into a spirit, a militant fighting spirit. But I won't take up any more of your time. I'm sorry, I hope I haven't bored. It's all senseless. And uh, I know it's no, um, um, there's no huge um, um, ideas that I've put out there, but I do think that problems that I raised within the, uh, the price of income in the court years and ones that we really have to learn from and uh, never repeat them. But, uh, thanks.
now we have time for some questions. seafaring section of the MUA, but if I was the Wharfie, I would have thought the merging between the two unions was not great, because Wharfies have paid it, on my side of the way of looking at things, which is, I think is a fairly objective way, uh, they've paid a very heavy price for the amalgamation, even though it's 23 years ago, um, it's still, um, it's, it was a heavy price paid. Unions went out of existence. Uh, Bobby Reid told Union the Painters and Dockers Union was forced out of existence because it didn't have 5,000 members. They just got rid of it. Yes, Comrade. Sorry. say that the Labor Party does more damage than any other political organisation, I'd probably say uh, the Liberal Party would do more and um, Paulie Hanson would probably do a lot more, but, um, mm -hmm. but in general I understand where you're coming from and when the, the look, we're in the middle of, a, a, of an election period, um, the amount of time and money and resources that are spent on trying to get the ALP up. Uh, I wonder, just in my own case, is whether that money is as well spent as we spend it on organising around the place. I, I would probably think it might be better, but the trouble is, is getting big bureaucratic unions to start thinking in that sense. That if we're going to spend a fortune on the ALP, you know, really, we have to start really thinking about spending a lot more on trying to organise the unorganised because that's where our core, our core strategy has to be. There might be syndicals there who probably wouldn't think they need any party. huge problem. Um, what they did is, well, the, Swedish, the Swedes have three labour organisations. They have one for uh, government workers, one for uh, professionals and one for blue-collar workers. Uh, the, the one for government workers uh, saw this problem and so they, they put a lot of resources into uh, trying to get into the areas where young people were going. So, look, the ACTU uh, did a, uh, put out a study about 10 years ago that stated that only six out of every 100 workers in the new economy are joining unions. The, the Swedish examples of this 36 to 40 percent are in unions, but you know it's unless we start tackling these issues and get people together and start really trying to drive down into where the problems are is that look you know we'll survive as a movement but what, what my my real worry about the Australian trade union movement is that we'll become just like, um, I mean, just become like in the half baked sort of like what it is in America, where you're a bit of an appendage feed of the Republican Party. You're just another uh, lobby group in society. No more different than ACOS, and no more different than someone else. That's what I worry about. One of the primary things that we become just another lobby group. Because once we start losing 
critical, we, you know, we're in the process of just about losing critical mass. And once that happens, the plummet, the plummet's been there. Like it's, the graph's not like that. It's like that. It's it's the worst in the world. It's the worst in the developed world that's happened to our union movement, apart from apart from the social laboratory of, uh, of New Zealand. Uh, yes, well, it's a difficult question. Bob, um, I know you've been to Paris recently, and I know you've been to the CPT, and we all must know what's going on over there and how they're leading, you know, as a union movement and as the people stepping up. What can we learn from them? What can we from them? I know they've got different legislation and all that kind of stuff, but... Well, I think you can learn, so what we can learn from the French is fearlessness, uh, the ability of their leadership to engage in battle, uh, their, their fearless engagement in the, in the struggle, uh, their uh, belief that uh, a union is uh, a union is more than just bricks and mortars, that a union actually exists in your heart and your soul, rather than just uh, having great edifices to to other to, you know to uh, to uh, big buildings and everything else. They're they're fundamentally about what what a union really is. The French are, are extraordinary. They're, they're really something else. Yeah, mate. Yeah, mate. Uh, look, I, I welcome, I welcome your uh, words on the accord. I live in my life. I never knew that the military did it by accord. All my time has been given to me, but I still believe that it's just one aspect of it. I'd like to ask you, what you feel? about the process because I know my experience has been with us mm. and we won some pretty significant battles because we concentrated on British people. I think the problem for the union movement at the moment seems to be that it's being led towards supporting capitalism and not being led towards supporting the liberation work. And to a degree, Dave, that's because of the collapse of uh, socialist support within uh, and competing ideologies within the within the labour movement. The trouble with the labour movement now, one of the problems, is that the competing ideologies, uh, sections of social democracy ideologies, where there's not really a, a Marxist ideology that's going, that uh, there's not even a Marxist current within the the current. Um, the current labour movement. We lost it with the split. Out we we lost that with the split. We lost it with a lot of things. You know, maybe we. Should, that's another thing that we really have to generate: having workshops and having conferences where people who have genuine ideas of genuine ideas of, of workers' liberation, whether it be from a Marxist, whether it be from a uh, you know classic communist party outlook or a Trotskyist outlook, or a, I've got two great comrades down here from the industrial workers of the world, and they're their um, syndicalist outlook, you know. I, I've been the, one of those things that uh, I was elected in, on the 11th of last month as the zone coordinator of the IDC. The IDC represents nearly 100,000 dockers around the world. You know what the bureaucracy of the IDC consists of? You know how many people, like 100,000 dock workers, guess how many people work in the bureaucracy of the IDC? One. One. It's not even a full-time official. There's one person who's an administrator, and it looks like we're putting on Jordi, a, a wonderful Spanish docker, as, a, as the first full-time uh, docker. He comes from a syndicalist outlook, and he is in this huge quandary about whether he should take a job full-time or not, because he worries about he can't go back to the docks. He did 16 flights last month in Europe, and he's wondering about when he can get a start and go back to his docks in Barcelona. So, you know. It's an amazing organisation. The flatter structures work. Flatter structures work, particularly in this climate. Hierarchical and bureaucratic structures are a recipe for either a quick or a very slow death. Absolutely they are. Because you can't move fast enough. That's the funny, that's the fundamental thing in today's world. Uh, 